Hello, I'm Venki Ramakrishnan. I was born in South India, but when I was three, my parents moved over a thousand miles away to Gujarat, a state in the middle of Western India, where my first memory is of standing by the edge of a playground and not understanding a word that the other children were saying. A couple of years later, my parents enrolled me in the only English school in town. Uh, but when I was in third grade, the nuns who ran that school converted it to a girls' school, but they let the boys who were already enrolled stay on. But by the time I graduated, the number of girls was about four times the number of boys in my class. And so effectively, I graduated from a girls' school. In between, when I was eight and nine years old, I spent time in Adelaide, Australia for a couple of years. And then when I was 19, I moved to the United States uh, to go to graduate school in physics. The reason I mention all this is that I've always been something of an outsider, uh, especially in much of my early life. And it's a feeling that never quite leaves you, even though I'm now quite a well-established scientist. When I arrived in America, I had a degree in physics from India, from Baroda University, and then I went enrolled to get a PhD from Ohio University. Uh, and after a couple of years of coursework, which I completed without any problems, I started doing my research in what we used to call solid state physics, but what today would be called condensed matter theory. And that's where the problem began. I felt that I didn't have any aptitude for it. I couldn't get a sense of what the questions were or how to even approach problems uh, in physics. But at the same time, I used to read Scientific American and I came across uh, articles in biology and it seemed that almost every issue of the magazine had some big breakthrough in biology from you know, the structure of molecules in our cells to the structure of our membranes uh, to how our immune system worked. The first sequences of DNA were, were coming out at that, at that time. Uh, and then there were also articles in neurobiology. And so it seemed to me that biology was at a very exciting stage and physics had become a sort of mature field. And I thought maybe I should actually go into biology and I might be able to do something there. Whereas if I stayed on in physics, I thought somebody like me would end up doing a bunch of boring calculations that didn't actually advance our understanding of anything. I also knew that some well-known biologists had started off as physicists, for example, Max Delbroek or Francis Crick. The problem was I didn't know any biology. And so right after my PhD, I enrolled again in graduate school, this time uh, to study biology. And this was at the University of California in San Diego. Now, the first week I was there, we were exposed to little talks by various professors uh, telling us about their research. And it was so full of jargon that I had no idea what they were talking about. For example, as a physicist, lambda meant a wavelength, but to them, lambda was a bacteriophage that attacked the bacterium E. coli. And so I took a step even further back, which is in my first year there, I took undergraduate courses in biology and cell biology, genetics, biochemistry, just to acquire a basic background in biology so I could understand what I was doing. And along with lab rotations, I also acquired a practical knowledge of how to do work in a biology lab. Now, in my second year, I came across an article in Scientific American on the ribosome. And one of them was Don Engelman. There were two professors at Yale, and one of them was Don Engelman. And he had written to me when I applied to graduate school at Yale they had said they wouldn't take me as a graduate student, but Don said he might consider me as a postdoc. And I had declined saying I didn't know any biology, so I wasn't ready to work as a postdoc. 
But this time I wrote to him and I said, look, you were interested when I actually didn't know anything. Now I've learned something, maybe uh, you, might, you might still be interested. And he introduced me to his colleague, uh, Peter Moore, and I ended up then going to Peter Moore's lab to work as a postdoc in, in uh, uh, working on the ribosome. And that's how I got into the ribosome. Now, after my postdoc, I applied for a large number of faculty jobs, but I didn't get a single interview. And I finally took a position with a neutron scattering facility at Oak Ridge, where I was supposed to be a sort of biology liaison. But when I found out I couldn't actually carry out my own biological research, I left only about 15 months later. And luckily I got a job at Brookhaven National Lab where I could combine working uh, on neutron scattering but also developing my own uh, research. I stayed there for many years, but a few years into, the, into my job there, I realized that neutron scattering wasn't actually getting me anywhere. It was sort of a dead end for me technically. Certainly it was not a way in which I could understand how the ribosome worked or really how much of anything worked. And so I realized it's a great technique for condensed matter physics or material science or areas of chemistry, but its use in biology is fairly limited. And so I thought, what should I do? And I ended up in making one of the most important steps of my career, which is as soon as I got tenure at Brookhaven, I went away on sabbatical uh, to the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, uh, which is, you know, in order to learn crystallography, uh, which is a high resolution technique. So it, can, it sort of connects structure with function and genetics. It's at the right sort of resolution to learn important facts uh, about how a molecule works. Now the Institute was a mecca for structural biology. In fact, it is where protein crystallography was developed, the structure of DNA was done in what was really the progenitor of the lab. And uh, also some of the first virus structures were done there. So I went there and learned how to actually solve crystal structures using data I had already collected at Brookhaven. Now the year at the LMB also taught me a number of reasons for its success. I found that there, unlike the vast majority of scientists, almost nobody at the LMB was working on routine problems just because they would lead to publications. And rather they were trying to ask the most interesting questions in their field and then developing ways to answer them. A simple but telling question they would ask each other was, why are you doing this? And if you couldn't answer that, then you, know, you had a problem, a serious problem. Another lesson was that even very famous scientists would unabashedly ask questions at lectures that often seem trivial uh, to people in the field. And so I learned it's never a shame or a disgrace not to know anything or to seek help. A third lesson was that a lot of the LMB's success had to do with limiting the size of teams to just a few people, sometimes even just one person working by himself or herself. What this does is it forces groups to focus on the most interesting questions and also to participate or stay closely in touch with the actual work. Today there's a tendency for famous professors to build up large groups, sometimes 20 or 30 people, simply because they can. This may be great for the professor, but it's not often a great environment for the people being trained because many of them are relegated to problems of lesser interest and they have less frequent mentorship. Not surprisingly, many studies also show that very large groups are actually less productive for the cost than smaller groups. A couple of years after my sabbatical, I moved to the University of Utah as a professor of biochemistry where there were a lot of excellent scientists doing both structural biology as well as work on RNA biology, which is related to uh, the ribosome, which is fundamentally an RNA machine. At that point, I decided 
to seriously start tackling the structure of the entire ribosome, but I had no idea how long it would take. A group in Germany headed by Ada Jonat had been working on the problem for 15 years, but with little progress towards an actual structure of the ribosome. In Utah, I would have to rely on three to five year grants, mostly from the NIH. And I was nervous about tackling such a hard problem because I thought after a funding cycle, I might have almost nothing to show for it. And then I would, you know, have trouble renewing it and then run out of grant money and that would be sort of the end of my research career. I also knew that the LMB where I'd done my sabbatical had a tradition of supporting exactly this sort of long-term challenging problem. So only a few years after I moved to Utah, I moved yet again and this time as a group leader to the LMB where I had done a sabbatical but I ended up taking a 40% pay cut and leaving our grown children behind in the US. And I should point out that I'm really grateful for having a, a, a spouse who was willing to sort of tolerate all these various moves of mine in pursuit of a career. And without that, it would have been very difficult. Fortunately, that decision worked out for me and I'm still here at the LMB where I had done my sabbatical and then returned seven years later uh, on a more permanent basis. So I suppose if I look back, there were some lessons you could draw from my career. The first is that if you hit a barrier, you have to keep giving yourself chances to succeed by being open to change, whether it's moving to a completely different field or learning a completely different technique or moving to different institutions or even moving to a different country. A second is never to be afraid to ask for help. I've often relied on colleagues, random people I've met, even people I've never met whom I've just asked uh, through the internet for help. A third is that just because you're an expert in your old field doesn't mean you're an expert and you know anything about your new field. Many physicists who go into biology fail because fail to do anything significant because they still think like physicists and have a somewhat arrogant attitude about them. The ones who did best, like Delbruck or Crick, effectively became biologists. They may have had a physics background, but they really were doing biology. They were thinking like biologists. Even those who didn't have to have enough humility to learn what biologists actually care about and learn what the actual questions are and talk to biologists and get feedback from them. And finally, luck and accident play much more of a role in science uh, than we usually admit. Now, Sri has asked me a couple of questions. She, the first thing she asks is, I read in your biography that immediately after your postdoc, despite applying to 50 faculty positions, you were not even offered one. Through this lens, would you please comment on extrinsic and intrinsic values in academia? How we value scientists by bestowing power, publicity, and prestige on them versus how we value their innate creativity, agency, and the longevity of their finding. I have to say, I can't, I'm not sure we can conclude anything at all from my being rejected an objective committee looking at me at that point would have seen someone who graduated with a pretty mediocre PhD thesis in physics, did a couple of years of biology in graduate school, then worked on an esoteric physical technique mapping on proteins on the ribosome, which from which it wasn't clear to, you know, it wasn't obvious uh, what I would do next and, and how my career would develop next. So if I'd been in their place, I would have put my application in pile B too. So the other thing is I also applied to some four-year colleges, you know, which are mo mostly teaching institutions, but they probably saw the same sort of somewhat mediocre uh, track record. And they also saw that I was from India with a long unpronounceable name and wondered if I could even speak English or, or, or you know, well enough to be a good teacher. So I basically struck out, but I frankly don't blame them. You know, people have to go with, 
you know, what they're presented uh, on paper. And, uh, you know, they, they simply have to make the, the, their best guesses. And, uh, and on paper, I don't think I was very promising uh, at that stage. I think the real problem, though, is that when we're in training, the only role models we see are senior academics. And the fact is, academic jobs are very rare and they're very competitive. And so what we really have to, and committees can only go by past accomplishments. <clears throat> so they'll tr favor people with a strong publication record uh, from good labs. And so that's just the reality. What the system does, should do, is make people aware of all the other jobs outside academia that are interesting and rewarding. And we should not see going into those jobs as failures, because many of them are at least as interesting and creative as academic research. I should say my plan B was to either be a high school teacher of science or mathematics, or to go become a computer programmer, because in the uh, 70s and even early 80s, computing, computer programming was a real skill, an employable skill. And, uh, you know, I think if I'd done either of those, I would still have had a, quite a rewarding life. So we need to get away from thinking of, you know, the tenure track academic, you know, path as the only route to success if you've been scientifically trained. The other is, Question three asks is that early career people are often told that doing good science and being a successful scientist are not always commensurate goals. If you were to reimagine how, to, how we do science as a community, what aspects would you change so the two are better aligned? So again, I have to say I'm not sure I agree with the premise of this. At least here at the LMB, would a we put a premium on doing good science. Above all, that is re regarded as a prerequisite to being a success. Now, it's true that at many places beyond doing good science, you have to have political networking and social skills to accumulate power. But perhaps we shouldn't equate power with success. Two of the best scientists I know at Rockefeller, both members of the National Academy, are both very shy and introverted types. So my feeling is always to do the best science you're capable of, but also be collegial and be a good citizen. You really can't go wrong that way. If you go into science craving power and fortune, perhaps you're in the wrong profession. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.